the title of my series is Saved to dot, 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 dot. What I mean by that, saved to, you fill in the blank. Well, obviously, I'm not going to ask you to fill in the blank. I'm going to fill in the blank for you. I'm going to tell you that God saved you for a purpose, for a reason. He's got things in your life that he wants to see happen. God saved you to dot, 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 dot. I want to remind you that salvation, being saved, is the beginning. It's the being. And then we are to do. So salvation in Christ is being. And then when we're in Christ, we do for Christ. So salvation is the beginning of being in Christ and beginning to do for Jesus. Some people have it backwards. They think that they have to do in order to be. That's not the way it works with salvation. You don't do to be. You become a follower of Jesus. You trust Jesus as your Savior. Then following that comes doing things for Jesus. Good works and acts of kindness and so on and so on and so on. Philippians chapter number 2, verse number 12, makes an interesting statement. And for some people, they misinterpret this verse. So let me explain this to you with the thought in mind that you get saved to be in Jesus, and then you begin to do things for Jesus. The Bible says, wherefore, my beloved brethren, people that are saved, okay? So I'm going to save people. Wherefore, my beloved brethren... As you have always obeyed, not as I'm in my presence only, but now much more in my absence. Look at this. Talking to save people. Work out your own salvation. Now, for some people, they mistakenly think that that is saying work to become saved. But remember, who's he talking to? He's talking to save people. He's talking to the church. He's talking to the beloved. That's the bride of Christ. That's Christians. So he's saying to Christians, work out your own salvation. So he's not saying to a Christian that you work to be saved. He's saying because you are saved, you should do the good works of God. You see, write it down. You don't work to be saved, but your work out comes when you are saved it's very important that you get the distinction there that we're not working to become a christian but once you become a christian you work out what is already in there you see salvation is this salvation is when you intellectually understand the gospel you have to know what is the gospel the gospel is the death, the burial, and the resurrection. If there is nothing else. That is the gospel. The gospel is not death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus and then join a church or be baptized. No, that's not, all that stuff's added. Gospel is death, burial, and resurrection. Okay, you have to understand the gospel. Intellectually understand. Jesus died on the cross for my sins. Buried. He was buried in the grave. Three days later, he arose from the grave. You have to intellectually understand that and accept that truth. Okay? And then emotionally, intellect, emotion, and will. Emotionally, you have to say, you know, I need salvation. I need salvation. Jesus who died on the cross for me. My life needs to be changed by the Jesus that was buried and arose from the grave. That's your emotional decision. That's the change in you emotionally. You're saying, I understand it, and I know that I need that. And then comes the will. The will is when you say, yes. I want Jesus as my Savior. I want to accept the death of the burial, and the resurrection, the gospel of Jesus for my salvation. I accept Jesus. I'm 
stepping over the line. You are having a change of your will. So a person that is saved is a person that has intellectually, emotionally, and willingly made that choice. And once you make that choice, once you are saved, then you are, the Holy Spirit comes to live within you, and you are saved on the inside. Now, once you're saved on the inside, you need to let the outside know. <laughs> you know, that's when you work out that which you have experienced on the inside. You let that work out of you to the outside. That's when you start doing for Jesus. So you are in Jesus. Jesus is in you. And then you start doing for Jesus. Him. I would suggest that the first step of developing a spiritual life, if you're interested in becoming a spiritual person, the first step is Bible salvation. You got to get saved. Listen to me now. You got to get saved. That's the first step. But that's not the last step. There's a lot of people that get saved as a fire escape from hell. They think, okay, I don't want to go to hell, so I'm going to get saved, so I don't have to go to hell. And you get saved because you don't want to go to hell, but then that is as far as your salvation ever goes. And I'm suggesting to you that salvation is the first step. That's good. Get saved. I don't want you to go to hell. I want you to live a changed life. I want you to be transformed. I want you... I want you to be saved, okay? So get saved, good, first step. But that's not the last step. That's the beginning. So you go from, okay, I'm saved now. Now I want to work out my salvation. I want my salvation to change me. And I want other people to see the change in me. I want to become that new creation in Christ like Jesus talks about. James chapter 2, verse 17 and 18. This is great. The Bible says, you know this first, the Bible says, even so faith, we already talked about faith, remember, faith and trust, like two rails on the two rails of the train track, they're running side by side. You have to, by faith and trust, accept Jesus. So you've, you've by faith, acknowledged, yes, I, I need to be saved, I want to be saved, and then trust, yes, I accept him as my Savior. So by faith, if it hath not works, is dead. It doesn't say it doesn't exist. It just says it's dead. You know, there are a lot of people that are saved, but their faith is dead. Why is it dead? Well, look at verse 18. The Bible says, yeah, man, say that I have faith. Wonderful. And I have works. Good. Show me thy faith without thy works, and I will show you my faith by my works. He doesn't say that I'm showing you my works to get saved, he's saying, I'm showing you my works because I am saved. You see, Christianity, salvation is action. It's not inaction. Write that down. Salvation, being saved, is all about action and not inaction. Faith in Christ will produce a life of action, not inaction. God doesn't want you to get saved, and I've said it so many times, I'm not going to say it again, but he don't want you to sit around. He wants you to move forward in your life and use your life for influence. I read this somewhere in the last few weeks, and I wrote it down. I think it's a great statement. Salvation is transformation and not evacuation. Salvation is transformation and not evacuation. What do you mean by that, preacher? Here's what I mean. Some people think that they get saved and it's like they have to get into bed and pull the covers up over their head and they're just never to be seen again. They evacuate from the world. Well, that's not what God wants you to do. God doesn't want you to evacuate from the world. God wants you to be an influencer in the world. God does not want the world in you. He wants you in the world. There's a big difference. You see, you don't have to live where the world controls you. But you need to live in the world. We can't live as monks, y'all. 
I don't want to live as a monk. I like going to Tuscaloosa and going to the Alabama football game. I, don't, I didn't see many monks there. I like, the, I like doing stuff. I like to be out. I love to go over to the gun shop and talk to people. I love to go out to the gun range and shoot. The gun. I love to be around people. And don't, I mean, come on, y'all. God never saved me to be so separated from people that I can't influence people. You know, there's a lot of rednecks out there need to get saved. I'm the perfect candidate to get them saved. If ever there was a redneck that could influence another redneck, And I mean that right. I don't mean that in a negative term. Don't I mean, some of y'all so politically correct. Like, don't y'all not say that redneck stuff. That ain't good stuff. Just get over it, would you please? I don't mean that in the wrong kind of way. So God wants us to be influencers. He doesn't want us to go in a hole. God says, you're transformed, don't evacuate. Titus chapter 3, verse 4 through 8. Titus 3, verse 4 through 8 says this, but after that kindness, things that you should be doing, showing. But after that kindness and love of God our Savior toward man appeared. God said to us, I'm going in my kindness and love, I'm going to send my one and only son Jesus for you. All right, good. We receive Jesus. Now we beget, we get what he is. He comes and lives within us. So we should start demonstrating what he is. Now, you're not saved by demonstrating, you're saved by receiving. He says, you're not saved by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us by the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Ghost. Mercy is when you don't get what you deserve. What do you deserve? Same thing I deserve. <laughs> we deserve hell. We deserve, we deserve to be judged. That's what we deserve. But God, through his mercy, doesn't get us what, give us what, he's, what we deserve. He gives us what we don't deserve which is grace which he shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior that being justified by his grace we should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life we get saved we now are heirs to a home in heaven he changes our life and God says I want you to be a representative of me out there in the world now, do you remember that little song? We, some of y'all got saved later in life, and you missed out on some of the good Sunday school songs. You know, the, Father Abraham had many sons. Many sons had father. You know that one, don't you, Jack? Yeah. Y'all remember that song? How about this one? You remember this one? This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. Let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. Let it shine all over Pensacola. I'm going to let it shine. Let it shine all over Pensacola. I'm going to let it shine. Let it shine, let it shine. Oh, y'all sing so good. Hey. Do you remember this part of the verse? Hide it under a bushel. I'm going to let it shine. Hide it under a bushel. I'm going to let it shine. Let it shine. Let it shine. Let it shine. Do you realize that that song comes from the Bible? Yeah. It wasn't something that, you know, our children's pastor made up. It's from the Bible. Matthew chapter 5, verses 13 through 16. The Bible says, you're the salt of the earth. Now, in those days, salt was like money. Salt was very, very valuable. And salt was a preservative. Salt would keep things from rotten. Still does that, by the way. You know, some old-time farmers, boy, they salt meat down and stuff. So he says, you're the salt of the earth. You should be making a difference in this world. You're the salt of the earth. But if, when, when salt loses its savor, when it's not salty anymore, when, it, when, it, when it's no good, wherewith shall it be salted? What's it, it doesn't salt anything anymore. You can't even shake it out of a shaker anymore. It's no good. It's good for nothing. But to be thrown out, 
trodden under the feet of men. Literally, they used to throw out the window. <laughs> and then literally, the horses and the cows would go by the front of the houses on the streets, and they would literally trot it under their feet. That's what that's talking about there. In other words, the salt was no good. It was not helping. It was not having an influence anymore. It was not making this, the meat taste better. He goes on to say, here's the, what we're talking about. You're the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men, oh, what do you know, light a candle and put it under a bushel. But they put it on a candlestick, and it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Do you get it? The Bible says, if you're going to have an influence, you need to be a light. And the brighter that your light shines, the more of an influence you have. Now, I'm taking a real risk here, y'all. This is risky. It's like getting kids up on the platform and asking them questions. That's risky. You never know what they're going to say. Some of y'all remember that, remember that Art Lincoln had a show? Kids say the darndest things. Well, sometimes candles don't light. So anyway, Lord, help that thing to light. Look at that light. It's just lit right up there just like it's supposed to. All right. Now. This light represents you. It represents me. Now, I'm not going to do this, but I could do this. I could turn off all the lights in here. I can't do it. I can't do it because if I did it, we got young people over here. They, they get busy. So I, gotta, I can't do that. I can't do it. Okay. okay. I can't do it. Some of them over here going, turn them off, preacher. <laughs> but, you know, I told the first service, I shouldn't blame it on the young people because I'm looking out there at some of y'all. I know what y'all would be doing too, so I'm not turning the lights off, okay? <laughs> okay. All right. <laughs> so here we go. If it were completely pitch dark in here, this light would be so, so bright. I mean, it would make a big difference. The truth of the matter is, you and I live in a dark world. Is it getting darker every day? Lord help us, it is, isn't it? It's getting darker and darker every day. So the Bible is true. It says you need to let your light shine before men so that they will see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Let your light shine. Now, when the Bible says don't hide your light under a bushel, literally it's talking about a bowl. You don't put a, 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 a light under a bowl because if you put the light under the bowl, what happens? What's it do? It, what'd you say, kid? Way to go, kid. It goes out. That's exactly right. If you hide it under a bushel, the light will go out. Now, hear me. If you hide your light, your gospel light, your transformation light, you hide it under a bushel, nobody's going to see it. Not only that, it's going to lose its oxygen, which makes it bright. You see, the reason it went out is because I'm depriving this flame, this light of oxygen. And when you deprive the flame of oxygen, it will go out. It's just like you and me. If we're living with our light under a bushel, if we're not telling anybody about Jesus, if we're not living a life that is pointing people to Jesus, if our good works are not out there glorifying Jesus and influencing the world for Jesus, let me tell you something. It not only affects the world negatively, it affects your light. Your light will go out. You will lose the brightness of your light. I've seen it happen over and over and over and over again. When people quit demonstrating good works for God, quit doing good things for people, when they quit doing what they're supposed to do, they're hiding their light under a bowl, under a bushel, and that light will go dim or go out. 
Now, I'm not saying you're going to lose your salvation. I'm not saying that at all. I'm, a, I'm saying that your salvation will have no effect on anybody. And you were saved. Saved. To have an effect. Now, I could talk about tons and tons of things <laughs> that you were saved to do or be. I, I could. I'm not going to do that. But in the next few weeks, I'm going to give you just two or three ideas. Next Sunday, we're going to talk about saved so that we can do what the New Testament church did. They sent out missionaries. Do you realize that you were saved to make sure that missionaries go into all the world? You, some of you didn't know that. We're going to talk about it. You were saved to share your story. On the 17th, I'm gonna, we're going we're gonna to go video a, a guy's story who got saved and radically transformed for God. And um, he owns a business. We're going to go to his business, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to interview him, and he's going to share his story. And in a video, I'm going to I'm gonna let you hear his story. And I'm hoping that that will challenge you to share your story. And then on the 24th, the last message will be on sharing the gospel. Have you ever had anybody, have you ever seen anybody demonstrate how to win somebody to Jesus? How to personally lead somebody to Christ? Don't raise your hand, but have you ever done that? You realize that you can do that? I'm going to have somebody up on the stage that's, maybe they're unsaved. Maybe probably Jeremy. I'll have Jeremy on the stage. <laughs> no, Jeremy's saved. He's a lot better Christian than I am, I tell you that. But I'm going to have Jeremy up on the stage or somebody, and I'm going to show you how to lead that person to Christ and have them to receive Jesus into their heart. We're going to do it on stage. Now, that's on friend day. Hear me. Get me now. Got a method to my madness here, okay? On that Sunday, it's friend day. So I want you to get all your friends here. So I'm going to be winning this person to the, to the Lord on the stage, hoping that those sitting out there that you brought will hear how they can be saved and they'll get saved. So that's what we're going to do. Because God saved us to share. Now, let me give you two points. Write them down. We're going to go to the house. Number one. God saved us to share by being a giver. Now, I, I want you to understand, according to 2 Corinthians, in fact, turn in your Bibles, if you will, to 2 Corinthians chapter number 8. And we're going to talk about Paul talking to the early church about their sharing. And he said, he gave, a, he gave a, an illustration of churches that were really good sharers. Second Corinthians chapter 8, beginning in verse number 1. The Bible says, Moreover, brethren, we do you to wit of the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia. He says, I want you to know about the graciousness of the churches in this area called, in this part of that part of the world called Macedonia. I want you, he said, I'm going to tell you about those churches and what they did. Look at this. He goes on, verse 2. How that in great trial, a great trial of affliction. In other words, they were going through it. They were having a tough time. The abundance of their joy, even though they were going through tough stuff, they didn't let it steal their joy. They didn't get into mother grubs. You know, they didn't get down and out about it. They didn't whine and bellyache about it. They didn't say, oh, you know, oh, gloom, despair, and agony on me. They didn't do all that. They just said, we're going to make sure that out of the abundance of our joy, we continue to do the right thing. The abundance of their joy and out of their deep poverty. He said they were going through financial strain. 
Financially, they were not doing well, these churches. He says, so out of the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded unto riches of their liberality. Even though they were down having a tough time, even though they were not doing well financially, they were liberal in their giving. They continued to be big, big givers in spite of their tough times. For to their power, he said, I bear record, yea, and beyond their power, they, will, they were willing of themselves, praying us with much entreaty that we would receive the gift and take it upon the fellowship of the ministry and the saints. They sent this gift to Paul for the churches, other churches. And Paul said, no, you, you, you guys are, listen to this, you, you guys are going through tough time. Man, your people lost their jobs and, you know, and you got all kind of trials and tribulations in the church. Paul said, y'all use it for your church. And they said, no, you're not robbing us of the blessing. We're giving it. <laughs> Paul said, we, we, we talk to you. Don't just keep it. You need it. And they said, no, you take it, Paul. God told us to give it. We're giving it. And this they did. Not as we'd hoped that they'd keep it and use it for themselves, but first they gave their own selves to the Lord and unto us by the will of God. He said, the reason why they gave like they gave, the, way they, the reason they shared was because they had given their self to God and God pointed out to them ways that they could be a blessing with their life and with their stuff. God told them to share what they had. And so they gave because God told them to. They gave themselves to God. And then because they were willing to give themselves to God, they were willing to give of their money and give of their stuff. So their heart was right with God. And so therefore they gave to God and to others. Write this one down. Giving is, not, uh, giving is an act of grace. When you have experienced grace, according to verse number one, then you want to give back to God and to others. If you have experienced grace, then you want to be a grace giver. You want to give grace to other people, and you want to give financially to other people. You understand that God graciously saved me, and he saved you, so that we would be gracious givers. You were saved to share, saved to give. You experience faith in Christ so that you can be a giver. He wants you to give. He didn't save you to hold it for yourself. He, he saved you to give away that which he has blessed you with. Salvation without giving is not gracious. If you're not a giver, then your salvation is not very gracious. You get it? Are you listening? Come on, say amen or something. I'm, not, I, I, I'm going to help you now. i got to help you here. This is so vital. Because look, we've already said, we've already said you don't want your light to go out, right? One of the ways that your influence on others can go out is when you become a taker and not a giver. It affects your whole, it affects everything about you. Taking and not giving, it affects you. Man, it affects your attitude, affects your outlook on life. You become a negative, pessimist person. You just, it just affects you. I mean, I mean, nobody likes to be around somebody that's just negative and stingy and, you know, they just kick you everything. You always think they're trying to take something from you. and Nobody wants to be around somebody like that. But you know, people love to be around givers, don't they? It's just an attitude, it's, you know, positive and, you know, it's just a giving attitude. People love to be around people like that. And you can seriously have a bright light for God if you make up your mind that you're going to be a gracious giver. You have experienced the grace of God, therefore you're going to graciously give. Be a grace giver. So, giving is an act of grace. We are saved to give. Number two, write this one down, last point. Number two, 
giving is not really related to income. Huh. What do you mean by that, preacher? Well, obviously around here we say people tithe. We say, you know, you ought to tithe. So you think, okay, that's related to income. Well, in a sense it is because we believe that tithing is 10%, which means if you make $100 a week, give $10 to Jesus, right? You make $1,000 a week, give $100 to Jesus. You make uh, $100,000, you give $10,000 to Jesus. You make a million dollars, I want to see you after the service, meet me right down front here. We're going to talk. So obviously, when it comes to tithing, yes. But here, think about, have you ever thought about this? Tithing is just a measuring point. It's just a starting point. It's just something that, you know, God says, you know, give your tithe and I'll bless you. If you give your tithe, you're being obedient to me. You're just being obedient. You're just giving back to God what already belongs to him. You're just saying, God, I'm going to give back to you. But have you ever thought that when it really starts to hurt you, then you're giving what's yours and that is beyond what is really the 10%. You see, when, when it starts really having an effect on you, that's when you really start giving. You give that 10%, that's good. Uh, man, I commend you. We got a 90-day uh, guarantee here. You give your tithe, you do it for 90 days, God doesn't bless you, you're not happy with what you did, you call us up in the office, I promise you it's the truth, you call us up in the office, we'll give you money back. Some money back guarantee because I believe in tithing. I, it's all good. But I'm, what I'm saying to you is we're not really talking about giving based on income. We're really talking about giving based upon your heart. Not looking at how little you can give, but how much you could give. What could you do if you had a giving heart Paul said in 2nd Corinthians chapter 9 verses 6 through 8 but this I say he which soweth sparingly shall reap also sparingly he which soweth bountifully shall reap also bountifully every man according as he purposeth where in his heart so let him give not out of necessity or because somebody's twisting your arm grudgingly for God loveth a what God loves a cheerful giver the Bible says here that you give as much as you can and expect God to bless you. Now, I am, you've heard of prosperity gospel doctrine, you heard of that? Anybody heard of that? You know what that is? That's when you hear these guys on TV and other places and they'll say, you know, send me a $20 seed gift. And if you'll send me a $20 seed gift, I'll lay hands on that $20 seed gift and God will bless it a hundredfold and you'll get... 100 times back on your $20 that you sent me in that seed gift. So send me $20. That's a bunch of bunk. That's baloney, y'all. Because some of y'all, y'all tried it. And your car broke down the next day. Am I telling the truth? Some of you going, I tried that. My car broke down the next day. You know why? Because, listen, sometimes... God just wants to test your heart. He wants to see if you're doing it, if you're giving to get. If you're giving to get, you're giving in the wrong frame of mind. You should be giving because in your heart you want to be an influencer for God. You want to do the right thing. You want your light to shine brightly. And the more you give, the more your light can shine because you're influencing people in the community with your giving. You're influencing people in this church. You're influencing this church. How in the world do you think we can go to Beulah and start a church? How can we go to North Face and start a church? How can we go out to Bellino and start a church and Perdido and start a church and even out there in Navarra? You like it, don't you, Jeremy? How? Because people have a generous heart. Because people give. You got to give from your heart. And when you give from your heart, God 
will bless you, not necessarily in money, but other way. He may bless you in money, but not, not necessarily. 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 2 and 3, look at this. The Bible says here in 2 Corinthians 8, verse 2 and 3, now that in great trial, these people were giving like crazy, but they were going through tough stuff. Just because you give doesn't mean you're going to have a rosy path and everything's going to be easy. It doesn't mean that. Now, they were in great trial and affliction. They, in, in, in deep poverty, they still gave. So the Bible says, giving is not based upon your income. It's a based upon your heart. Oh, I have people all the time tell me. Over the years, people tell me this all the time. Pastor, well, as soon as I start making a little bit of money, as soon as I start making more money, I'm going to give. No, you're not. You're not giving now. I don't believe you're going to start giving then. You know what happens? The people forget about that promise they made to God. You, you ever know anybody made promises to God they forgot about it? People think, oh, when I start making more money, I'll start giving more. No, you won't. No, you won't. You know why? Because the Bible says, he that is faithful in the little things will be faithful in the bigger things. When you learn to be faithful when you're not making a lot of money, then you will be faithful when you start making more money. Now, sometimes that's not true because it is so, I think, sad and it's so, it's, it's just awful that God blesses a man or blesses a business and blesses a church family. And some people in the church, they start making big, big dollars. They're making money like crazy, but they're giving just it's not affected. It doesn't go up. I don't understand that. What's the deal with that? Well, it's probably because when you were making $100,000, you didn't give like you should have. So now you're making a million dollars, and you're probably not going to give like you should there either because you hadn't learned the lesson that it's not based upon the amount of money that you make. It's based upon your heart. It's something you need to get in this area of your life. I'm not saying you're a bad person. I'm not saying, you know, you're not a good church. I'm not saying, I'm just saying in this area of your life, your light, your candle is not shining bright because you're not doing what you could be doing in your giving. So take the bowl off of your light, give. And let God bless your influence through your giving. Jesus commended the widow and she only gave a penny. So it's not based upon income, right? He saw her heart. She gave that penny. And it, and it hurt when she gave it. But God saw her heart. And Jesus said she's given more than anybody. Because she gave from her heart. She wasn't stingy in her heart. She gave from her heart. I would suggest to you this morning that God wants to, you know what God wants to do? Now, listen to me. Sometimes people say, <laughs> are you, everybody listen, are you listening? Say amen. Come on, don't shut, don't shut down on me yet now, okay? Follow, follow here to the end. Sometimes people say, well, or write me a text or email or something and say, oh, preacher, we, we, church must be going through financial strain because you're preaching on giving. Nah. I'm not preaching on giving because our church is doing fantastically well financially. We're, we, we will end up way, 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 way more money this year than we had last year. I, 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 I'm doing this for you. I'm doing this for you. I'm not doing this for, I have preachers all the time, they call me and they'll say, Pastor, man, everything's going good. At your, but man, we are struggling financially. We, man, we're having a hard time. And we can't do what we want to do. We can't do the ministries we want to do because the people just will not, they, I can't get them to, to give. And I say, look, you, you, need to have, you need to preach on revival. Preach on Revival. You know, the word for us this whole year is revive. Because when, when, when hearts get right, giving gets right. So, if, if you want 
to take the lid off of your light? Give. Because when you put the lid on by not giving, your light will go out. So I'm saying if you want your light to, your, your light to shine and you want your life to be blessed, you need to be a giver. And please don't look at how little you can give, but look at how much you can give and see what God will do for you. My wife and I learned this lesson a long time ago when I used to have to go door to door selling fish, quarter a piece or three for a dollar. I'd knock on the door. You want to buy some mullet? Yes, sir. I'd love to buy some mullet. I just called them this morning. They're fresh. How much are they? Quarter a piece or three for a dollar? Give me a dollar's worth. Okay, I'll take you a dollar. Thank you. I learned a long time ago. Listen to this. Listen. <laughs> We had, one of, we, we had one of the deacons come over to our, over to our house. We will have supper for the deacons. This is back years ago, in 1980. And one of the deacons come over to the house, going to have supper. We had a little, little metal dining room table. Y'all know what I'm talking about. Now those things are cool, you know. <laughs> back then they weren't cool. In a little metal dining room table. And we had furniture in the living room. And the deacon and his wife came in. And they sat on the couch. And when they sat on the couch, the couch collapsed. Because I had concrete blocks underneath there hold, <laughs> holding the couch up. They weren't big people. <laughs> These are not big people. Okay. They just, when they sat down, they didn't sit down. I had learned to sit on the couch carefully. Because <laughs> you don't want it to shift. So when you sit, you sit straight down. You don't. Just sit like that because you sit like that, it'll just. And so they sit down together and the whole couch just collapsed. By the way, they owned a furniture store. <laughs> Hallelujah, thank God. They went to their, they, this is this, they went to their living room at their house. They had brand new furniture in their living room. They went to their living room and loaded all of their living room furniture up in a, in a van a big moving van and brought it to my house and gave me all of that furniture that they had in their living room. Yeah. I mean, we, we kept it. We, we still had that furniture in our house. When we moved here. We still had that furniture in our house till a couple of years ago. <laughs> we moved in Marcus Point back there. Well, it was great furniture. I'm talking about, we learned back then that God wants us to be givers. And we started tithing way back then. We started giving. Now, do not take this wrong. Some of you are going to get all puffed up. Do not take this wrong. I'm only saying this because I want you to understand something. My wife and I have always been in the top five givers of this church. Always. There's some of you sitting out here, you make thousands, 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 millions of dollars, and, and you, you know, you're not in the top 20. We are in the top five. Let me tell you why. So I can look at you and say, don't do as, as I say, but do as I do. How about that? I want you to know that I'm not asking you to do something that I don't believe in. I'm not asking you to do something that we don't do ourselves. We are givers. And so I can, with a clear conscience and a, with all the power that comes with that, say, if you'll do it, God will bless you in your giving as well. He'll take care of you. His grace is sufficient. He will take care of you. So I'm asking you, you're saved to share. And let's share by giving.